I'm going to talk about um, three main areas. Vulnerability tracking, how we can, as a large distribution of upstream software, track vulnerabilities in the upstream software we ship. Uh, then about tool chain hardening and um, in the final part about distribution-wide defect analysis. So vulnerability tracking these days for all major Linux distributions is CVE-based. CVE, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, is a project started by MITRE. And it aims to assign a unique identifier to every publicly disclosed vulnerability. Um, I've put up uh, an example for such an identifier. Basically, it's just CVE dash the year dash uh, increasing number within that year. Um, the CVE project doesn't create a taxonomy. It's more like bird ringing in the sense that uh, ornithologists uh, put on little rings with numbers on the legs of birds so they can track them. And CVE is uh, aimed at identifying vulnerabilities in concrete software products, in concrete versions, not about general vulnerability classes like buffer overflow exploits or similar. Um, what happens these days is that CVE assignment alerts distributions because anybody can download the CVE database from Vitus website and you can see, okay, compared to yesterday, there have been these identifiers assigned and then you can start processing these new vulnerabilities. This works very well for public issues and we actually have an, a mailing list run by Open Wall called OSS Security, where Red Hat's Kurt Seifried watches and assigns um, CVE identifiers for uh, uh, requests that come in for assignments so that um, the uh, uh, vulnerabilities that haven't been I haven't received a CVE identifier yet, get one. And there are also many identifiers assigned by vendors who have their own pools so they can put on a CVE identifier when they release a security advisor without coordinating with anyone. These CVE identifiers often have less than clear public descriptions, so we don't really know what's it about. But for the uh, identifiers that are assigned through the open process, code is very diligent in making sure that the um, vulnerabilities are precisely described so that we actually can use these identifiers light, later on. So how do we um, use these identifiers? We have to put... Um, the, the identifier in relation to the software we ship. And there's the first aspect is the package. We have to identify that, which package is affected. And for each branch we ship, we can just, um, note a minimum fixed version when you, when you fix the package. This is um, an approach that is based on version-based vulnerability tracking. Um, First, I wanted to present it as uh, the ultimate approach to vulnerability tracking, but it turns out that I had forgotten that it's really, really complicated in some corner cases to make this work. So um, Debian is doing this for, for, for the unstable and stable distributions, and we have learned over the years that it is really complicated um, to cover all eventualities, but it works for us, it works really well to some extent. Um, obviously, the version based vulnerability tagging is uh, tied to version numbering scheme and branch model, so you cannot reuse 
Debian versions, version numbers on Ubuntu or even on OpenSUSE or Fedora, that, that's not going to work. So here's an example from the same CV identifier as before. That's a vulnerability in Ruby on Rails, which is related to YAML parsing. YAML is yet another markup language, and it has the uh, odd aspect that it's a superset of JSON and XML at the same, ti same time. And the Ruby programmers used the YAML parser to pass um, XML and JSON, I think. And there, uh, the problem with that is that YAML is far more powerful. It's, it's comparable to PHP's Unserialize or Python's Pickle or Perl's Storable in the sense that once you serialize an untrusted object, you almost, are almost guaranteed to have arbitrary code execution because YAML deserialization instantiates arbitrary objects. And you don't want to do this with untrusted data. So here's an example from the Debian version tracking database. And I'm just concentrating on the annotations uh, for the unstable branch and for the squeeze, the stable uh, release. Um, the squeeze release Ha, had received a um, security update. So there was a subsequent security update, this one. And we, it, it's on the same branch, so we know that it's fixed by comparing it with the branch-specific fixed version. And for the unfixed versions, we have um, an older version from testing that's, that was uh, in, in testing or unstable before uh, the bug was fixed. And here's an older version from the squeeze release branch which predates the fixed version. And the, the interesting thing that is that the, this data can be used to rate installed packages on the system. So you, can use this data to see if you, you have got vulnerabilities on your system. Um, the other approach for vulnerability tracking that's probably used by most other distributions is just file tracker bugs in your bug tracker. Um, that's what Red Hat is doing with Fedora and the supported products. Basically, the security response team creates a tracker bug in bugzilla.reta.com, which is uh, alias to the CVE. Um, this tracker bug will be made public after disclosure. And there's also extensive metadata in the whiteboard field of that uh, bug, which is also publicly accessible. And this tracker bug depends on product-specific bugs. Usually, you can only see those uh, for Fedora, not for the, um, the, internal, the internal product bug. Uh, the internal tracker bugs for, for the enterprise products are usually in a pu not publicly accessible one because there's QA information in them. And that's usually not interesting. So what happens when you upload to Fedora using and a URL on the tracker bug, Zilla bug for Fedora is that the Fedora update system actually feeds back the fixed version information into Bugzilla. So you have that in a single place. And all this is quite different from version-based tracking. But um, the, the advantage is it's conceptually much simpler. And you can cover any case because you never actually have to compare version numbers. So even if your version numbering scheme is totally strange, explicit tracker bugs still cover it. So the, um, here's the same vulnerability. Um, and if you pull up the slides uh, later from the web page, you can 
look at the uh, references there. The URL at the top is the CVE tracker bug. You could actually put the CVE name behind the I equals sign, and it would still work because it's an alias. And the, uh, the Fedora tracking bugs are public, and there are internal bugs for the enterprise products, which are also affected by this vulnerability. And these enterprise products were eventually fixed through the security advisories that I mentioned there. And obviously, there's a lot of automation for this uh, to work smoothly. So I believe that Ubuntu, Gen2, OpenSUSE, et cetera, use similar schemes um, for vulnerability tracking. And the good thing is that most upstream projects provide critical information to, to uh, power this sort of vulnerability tracking. They have their impact anal analysis and a concrete description of the vulnerability in the security advisory or in their bug tracker. And they often link to individual patches or commits in Git or uh, Mercurial repositories that fix specific vulnerabilities. So um, we need, as, as a Linux distribution, we need these individual patches to be able to, to um, prepare security updates because we don't want to bundle months of unrelated development work with a security update because too much could break. So if we don't have this information, we have to reverse engineer it from tarballs we could download from, from, from your website. And this is time consuming. You already have done this work. And we would like to spend them on patch review or testing. And as a Linux distribution, we will always distribute isolated security patches um, and make it quite visible what we are fixing because um, that's just how we prepare the updates. And some of the analysis is also on, on the public OSS security list. So by hiding this information, you have not much security advantages. So the, the important thing here is that uh, we, oh, sorry, uh, we really want to have, uh, we really want to encourage upstreams to, to make uh, available individual commits in public version control repositories so that these security fixes can be prepared in a timely manner. So one thing that comes up at this point is how can we improve cross-distribution information sharing at this point? Um, one thing that's annoying, or just a fact of life, is that versioning schemes and package names differ greatly between different distributions. Even though we all ship Firefox under some name, we ship GCC, we ship Bash, we ship Apache HTTPD, and yet the names of the packages are all a bit different, and we also encode the upstream versions in different ways into our own versioning schemes. But I think in an abstract sense, the CVE to packages mapping could be shared. Um, there's a separate project for that for, for it's called, uh, it's called uh, common platform enumeration. That's also from MITRE. Um, this might, uh, act as, as a meet in the middle point where both the distributions can see, OK, this CVE um, uh, applies to this CPE, and our own packages to this CPE are such and such, and this should uh, make this initial mapping step e easier. But uh, apart from that, it's uh, really difficult to, to, to automate the versioning part of this. So 
what is the fixed upstream version look like, and this information is really hard to, to automate, unfortunately. But again, please publish your security patches in a public accept, publicly accessible version control repository as separate commits. So this is something we, as, as Linux distributions, we value tremendously, and we would like to encourage to keep it that way. It's not a trend that vendors uh, go away from uh, publishing individual patches, but uh, there are still there are a few projects that have, that has, have always operated by releasing complete tables, which can obtain unrelated, unrelated development and not just security fixes. And of course, there are some projects that go from an separate patch point of view to, to a tarball-based distribution. And we don't hope that this trend, that, that this turns into a trend or uh, causes a problem for us for pro preparing security updates. So that's uh, it for um, vulnerability tracking. The next part is tool chain hardening. Um, basically, that's about changing GCC, bin utils, the kernel, let's see, everything that below, lies below most programs running on GNU Linux and uh, change them to reduce the impact of security vulnerabilities. Most of these uh, countermeasures are probabilistic countermeasures against code execution. That means that there's always a non-zero probability that an attacker goes through because there's randomness involved. And if the attacker guesses correctly, it's, going, uh, it's still going to result in code execution. And the, the countermeasures basically fall into two different uh, areas. One aspect is we try to make uh, it more difficult for the attacker to write at a specific memory location that is um, uh, that affects the program's control flow. So um, it should not be easy to redirect execution because. Um, the memory location is not either not writable at all or it's difficult to locate in the program. And the other aspect is that we want to make it more difficult to uh, write a value that has a meaningful impact and for, for the program being attacked and not uh, so that it doesn't really result in a crash but does something more interesting for the attacker. And it's important to, to keep in mind that these are not complete solutions. What we do is we make the program crash if the countermeasure is effective um, and code is not executed, but it's still a crash and these bugs obviously still need fixing. They are just something that might be lower priority, but uh, it's still something we actually want to fix at some point. So these features mentioned on, on this page are um, mostly enabled by default, just if you use GCC on, and the tool chain. Um, the first point is address space layout randomization that uh, reorders shared libraries, so they are positioned in, in the address space. It, the, the start address of the stack is randomized, the start address of the heap is randomized. Um, this makes it more difficult to, to find uh, spaces to write to in a predictable fashion, and uh, it also makes it more difficult to get a valid function pointer to code in a shared library because the address has been randomized. Then there's another aspect about um, program start addresses. I'm going to cover that in a minute. Then the next uh, thing that you get basically for free is non-executable stack and heap. You, uh, that means that 
when the attacker supplies code to your program and it's stored on the heap, uh, it, it, it is not directly executable because the heap hasn't got the execute bit in the patch protection set. That relies on hardware support for um, uh, x86 that hasn't been in the initial architecture, but all chips in Carmel use have it, so it's basically universal, universally available. Then, also some, some time ago, it must have been several years by now, is that we have fixed glibc so that double free bugs where you deallocate the same pointer twice do not result in, an, in a bug that's directly exploitable for code execution or heap manipulation. There are, there are uh, checks in, in glibc that detect um, such direct exploitation attempts. Then there's a stack protector that's about protecting the return address on the stack so that a stack-based buffer overflow that, over, that overrides the return address also overrides, overrides a, a, a stack canary and the canary then is, is checked before returning from the function if it has the expected value and if it hasn't, we assume it has been overwritten by an attacker and abort the program. This kind of measure you have to enable it explicitly, but most distributions have uh, tweaked the GCC defaults in a way that this is always active when compiling programs. Then there are additional compiler warnings for form and string misuse. Some distributions turn them into errors, either during build or in a separate step by examining the build logs and the warnings GCC has written. And there are also warnings about um, some cases of integer overflow that trigger undefined behavior. What's new, what uh, that, that landed in GCC in last fall is operator array new hardening for C++ programs. There used to be a really old bug uh, disclosed in 2002, which uh, basically means that if you allocate a large array using GCC and operator new, it could happen that the value wrapped around internally and what you get back from, from, from the C++ runtime library is just a very small, small heap block and then you start writing into the array and you get an, a heap-based buffer overflow. Um, this has been fixed in, in GCC 4.8, which is currently under development. Uh, it's always active, there's no way to turn it off. And the patch has already been backported to Fedora 18. So Fedora 18, in Fedora 18, most critical patch, uh, packages have been rebuilt with uh, GCC and the fix applied. The, 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 the unfortunate in aspect of this vulnerability is that it is in code generated by GCC. So you have to recompile everything that might use this C++ functionality and uh, before that, you still have latent exposure to this vulnerability. But uh, it's going to be fixed, and GCC 4.8 is going to be released in, in, in April or May, I think. So then, or you could uh, just pick up the backported patch from Fedora. So another thing about two-chain hardening, this is completely optional, but many distributions enable it. It's called Fortify Source. The, 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 the very neat aspect is the first item that's a cooperation between GCC and glibc. GCC uses a, uh, provides a compiler built in with, where you can put in a pointer, a bare pointer without any length information, and GCC uses context from the program source code it sees to infer the length of the array. And GNULIPC contains wrappers that pass, pass this length information if it is available, it's not always all available, of course, to, to wrapper functions which perform length checks. So what you get there is you have 
um, you have stack-based buffer overflows, which uh, reliable result in crashes because the length check kicks in and terminates the program before the buffer overflow actually occurs. And uh, GNU libc, is libc disables a person n in writable format strings um, in fortified source mode. There used to be a bug, but uh, this has been fixed. And, and the, the, the second point, uh, it uh, disables, disarms format string attacks that use person n for writing uh, data in a controlled fashion. So, not everything uh, is, uh, we, we don't enable all um, hardening opportunities uh, or functionality that is readily available in the two chain right now. For instance, uh, one thing that would help and which is obviously on the way is to get rid of 32-bit architectures because 32-bit, um, 32 bits are just too little, uh, contain too, too, too little entropy f to get full randomization and full unpredictable heap and addresses or shared library addresses. Um, there's also the, another aspect because size T is 64 bits in 64-bit uh, architectures, you, op you often have uh, integer overflows that result in buffer overflows, which are only exploitable on 32-bit architectures because on 64-bit architectures, the multiplication is um, in 64 bits and just doesn't overflow there. So getting rid of 32 bits is one step that's going to happen eventually uh, and will help us somewhat in this area. Another thing that's actually pretty easy to do, but Fedora, for example, hasn't done is disable prelink. Prelink disables address space layout randomization because it picks a single fixed value that is valid until you run the tool the next time on this system. So it's not um, entirely predictable. It still probably works quite well against network-based attacks well, the, well, where the attacker doesn't see the, the uh, addresses on the local system, but it doesn't work against local attackers who can just check what are the addresses used on this system by prelink and use uh, this information for uh, further attacks. What we should do is randomization of program start addresses. That is one point we do not uh, fully, where well, we do not fully randomize uh, executable pages in the in the process image. Basically, all processes have a start address, um, with um, which is a four and a couple of zeros, and that's a constant. And the fear is that the the actual program itself contains enough machine code to provide targets for return-oriented programming. So there is the potential of uh, address space lay layout randomization bypass there. Um, this hasn't been implemented because there is a concern for, for overhead, and, uh, but Grant Murphy has recently done some analysis and it looks like we should really do this and enable it for everything and not just critical network services like OpenSSH. Then another thing we can do, which is readily available, is bind now. That's a feature of the LDSO dynamic linker. And it instructs the linker to perform all symbol resolution at program start and then make the global offset table read-only. This means that uh, the global offset table cannot be overwritten by attackers and because it contains function pointers, among other things, um, it was really important to uh, get this protection. What we also can do, but which doesn't seem to be much on the radar, is 
we could compile every package with f wrap v. This makes integer overflows in C deterministic using two complements arithmetic. But um, uh, this only helps broken programs which use incorrect ways for overflow checking in C or C++. So it's not really compelling to enable that because it interferes with loop optimization. But maybe we have to bite the bullet and enable that as well. The next point um, that, that's also already in, in GCC has been for a while. That's F stack check or stack checking. Um, that's about um, stack-based buffer overflows or uh, stack point uh, manipulation uh, resulting from unloaded allocate calls or variable length array allocation on the stack. Basically, what happens is that um, I call to allocate with a large argument, moves the stack pointer from within the allocated stack completely outside the stack where anything can happen. Most of the time there was going to be a crash, but it's conceivable that this is exploitable. And uh, I think it has been just demonstrated recently that these things can re result in arbitrary code execution. The state right now is that F stack check has considerable code size impact because every call is instrumented, even though the stack frame is small and doesn't contain alloca calls. So we really need to work on that and uh, get the code size impact down, and then we can start looking at uh, performance impact in more detail. Um, there's a backup plan if, if uh, the ex, uh, ex current approach about uh, which writes um, probe values on in a sequence on the stack and hopes to reach the guard page uh, on a large alloca and uh, which will kill the process. Um, if this approach with the loop and the, all the writing is too expensive for alloca, we have, as a fallback plan, we probably could stack boundaries provided by split stacks without actually enabling split stacks. We would only use the stick, stack boundary that is used by split stacks um, to detect uh, that the, we are too close to the top of the stack to fulfill the alloca allocation request. And I, I hope that we will be able to, to tackle this problem this year, because there's so much code out there that uses Alloca, and so far, attempts to, to, to discourage its use have not been received by programmers, because they like it. It's an easy interface. You don't have to call free, unlike malloc. But uh, it obviously has this security risk, and so we have to fix it in the tool chain. One thing that I'd like to see fixed as well is uh, subscripts checking, checking for operator brackets in C++. That affects standard vector, standard string, and standard array. So if you use this shorthand notation, it's basically currently with the glibc. Uh, with the GCC, it's, um, it's as safe as C, as, as C programs because there's no range checking, even though the runtime library knows how long the array is and could insert the size checks uh, as it is done for Java or uh, Python or many other programming languages. The C++ standard actually gives us permission to do this check, um, but uh, we try to make the change to the library and implemented it, and it seemed to have a performance impact on tight loops. So we had to um, put it on the back burner, uh, back burner for now. And uh, I think there's further re research needed how we can, to, uh, can address this. And in the meantime, if you're a C++ programmer and want a sub subscript check, you have to use the add member function which is the same as the subscript operator, but is required 
to perform the subscript check. So this is something where we still have to do some work, I think. So one aspect that makes it difficult for us to talk about these hardening features is that we have to decide how much performance impact we want to take uh, in order to improve security. And what I'm trying to show here is we have um, a countermeasure that we implement, and the damage just stays unchanged. And now we deploy an effective countermeasure, and the damage we measure from attacks we measure goes way down, and then comes a new attack and goes up. The problem with that is we lack data on detected attacks at a large scale um, because we currently aren't a target in the sense that others are. Uh, it would be different if Oracle had open sourced the uh, Java plugin, obviously, but fortunately for us, that's kind of out of, out of scope for, uh, right there. That then we would have these, this data available what changes we make and what changes uh, we see in uh, attack success. But lack of this data makes it really difficult to, um, uh, judge uh, security improvements in the tool chain in, on, in an objective way. So here's a quick, quick list of things we could do if we feel that we are want to make things comp uh, to take it to a new level. Um, there are some things we can do to C, C++ that probably uh, uh, change the language quite a lot and um, require probably standards works. So it's a very long-term um, project. I'm not sure if, if that's going to happen anytime soon. And equally unrealistic is library consolidation. Um, that's a thing that should happen, but um, it's unlikely to materialize. I think most Linux distributions ship four or five different implementations of SSH, and that's something that's for the complex crypto uh, protocol that's not going to help to bring down security bugs. One thing that might help is floss specific secure coding, uh, co coding guidelines. There have been a couple of uh, books about secure coding, but they usually do not address uh, new Linux needs and are pretty much out of date by now. So we probably have to revive that. And eventually all this um, uh, experience we gain from fixing vulnerabilities and documenting risky library calls should probably lead to better APIs at one point, but that's also rather long term. And of course, we can go completely crazy and rewrite everything in a different programming language. And Curiously, that's not going, it's, it's completely unpractical right now because most of the new system programming languages are just not deeply embeddable in the sense that we can replace code in a library and the calling program doesn't notice that it's no longer C but Rust. For example, the Netscape Security Services Library could eventually use Rust for implementing critical functionality, uh, but right now, neither of the languages except Ada and maybe Luajit qualify for this kind of deep embedding. Um, and Ada is probably not to everyone's taste, but it, there are tremendous, there's a tremendous amount of um, tools available for Ada which help to build secure software. And perhaps we should look into that more. And I understand Ada has a... Um, huge following of uh, programmers here at FOSTEM, so maybe that's going to be interesting. Um, so my final topic is distribution-wide defect analysis. 
Um, this is uh, about using tools to find vulnerabilities across a whole distribution. And what I did for preparing this slide is uh, we ran a proprietary static anal analyzer on all changed packages in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6, which were released in 2012. And we looked at the changes reported by the static, anal uh, the, uh, the, the static, static analyzers report a huge number of uh, potential issues, and we looked at the before-after state for each um, uh, reported bug, and found interesting. Interestingly, found actual matches for vulnerabilities and bugs we have fixed in. Um, we have fixed in uh, in Errata during 2012. Only the first one is a real security bug. The other ones were uh, regular bugs, and the first one actually was caught by by the uh, Fortify source buffer checking logic because GCC has sort of its own static analyzer implemented. So this is something we, we should gather more data on it. And there's a Fedora project, here's the URL, which uh, tries to gather all kinds of information about um, open source static analysis tools so we can use them in Fedora and uh, actually tweak them so that they match closely to the APIs we use and provide us with good information about our code. One thing that I find very interesting is matching machines and humans and coupling their um, different skill sets. And one thing that you can do is you can take a search engine, what actually is happening right now a lot, and search for certain patterns, and then manually go through the hits and identify potential security issues that are uh, related to the search string. For example, the Ruby on Rails vulnerability I mentioned earlier um, could be located in uh, using this uh, string, and this could point to code copies that have similar vulnerabilities. But code search engines are sort of difficult to set up, so uh, Vincent Danen and la later myself uh, have written an indexer for elf symbol databases, for an elf symbol database. Basically what we do, we uh, unpack RPM packages, pipe them through an ELF parser, and load the results into a PostgreSQL database. And that has really interesting applications. You can use the full power of PostgreSQL joins and anti-joins to use uh, and use them to find library calls that are highly likely to be vulnerable to, vulnerable to specific um, attacks like um, here, the first example is uh, from expat where you call, call it XML parser create, but do not restrict the entity expansion using XML set entity decal handler. And this means that a small XML file you download from the net can blow up in your process into a multi gigabyte um, XML structure. Or, you, or this one is pretty complicated, but can be implemented in SQL. You can implement the dynamic linker or model the dynam not dynamic linker using recursive queries in PostgreSQL. And then you can find insecure users of getEnd from PAM and NSS uh, name service switch modules. That uh, uh, this is something that could lead to privilege escalation because the, the, the module, the PAM module, the NSS module, could run in a privileged process such as SU or PathVD. So I think for global analysis, we could uh, 
do much more if we had better tools. We could use debugging information. And something we could do is we could actually pass the compiled code and um, extract further information from this assembly. And it would be nice to cover additional languages. And for dynamic languages like Python or PHP, we probably need heuristics to uh, gather good information about the functions which are being called by the programs. So what I hope to have eventually is to have uh, combined the F-symbol database with something that uh, go through the binaries and extracts function arguments, for example, and uses that to validate, uh, to, to discover certain types of vulnerabilities like uh, unsecure U-mask in demons or ex 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 accidentally disabled SSL certificate validation or uh, the, the, the last point is about path max, uh, bugs because path max actually isn't a hard limit on Linux. And we could use the F symbol database as an index to locate interesting points and then use disassembly to extract the function arguments and actually find all these calls in a reliable manner. So that's it for me. Um, so I think the two things you should take home is we should try to fix LOK this year. And static analysis and code search, search engines are exciting. And please share your version control repository so that we can use that to prepare security updates. OK, that's it for me. If there are any questions. Um, since uh, there is not so much time, there, are, there is time for just two questions. Uh, anybody? Is there any question? One, two, three. Okay, then. Thank you.